We continue with chapter 8 and I will spend some time on figure 8.2. Um, so if you read through the chapter and you try to understand 8.2, it could take you a while. So um, let's start by uh, just understanding what's going on. So look at the axis. So they have pre-transfer income, so there's straight lines and two graphs with the same axis. So let's, let's just try and understand the basics here. Pre-transfer incomes, post-transfer income. So we have uh, primary income and then secondary income. Um, and what would the 45 degree line mean? So let's say we start with the 45 degree line. What they've done is they have Y minimum on the left and Y maximum on the right. So the idea is to order all citizens of the country in, in, the, in on the horizontal axis as well as the vertical. So that they, they line them up from lowest income, from zero income to very high income. So if pre-transfer income is the same as post-transfer income, then that means the government doesn't transfer anything. So a 45 degree line just means there's no government action and they've just drawn a line and to show how income increases as uh, from lowest to highest. Now the increase will probably not be a straight line, but this is, this is just the idea. So let's dissect this for a, for a bit. If we just look at the 45 degree line, income post transfers is equal to income pre transfers. So let's have a poverty line. So below a certain line, if this is a 45 degree line, then that means why two of the people uh, from zero, from the origin to the point Y2 on the horizontal and vertical axis lie below the poverty line. Above that, then, so income is increasing. Income is increasing as we go from left to right and as we go from bottom up. So uh, up to this point, everybody is below the poverty line. And above that, everybody is above the poverty line. So what would... Uh, line like this mean. The slope is the same. So we've just shifted the whole, um, we've just shifted the curve upwards by amount A, isn't it? So we know the curve has an intercept A and in the, what would be the uh, equation? It always helps me if I can write down the equation of the line. So Y post is equal to A plus Y pre. If the original line was y post equals y pre, now it's y post is a plus something. So that means a universal transfer to all persons. Universal means everybody gets it. So you need to understand and remember the difference between a universal transfer and a targeted transfer. So universal means it's not targeted. Targeted means only some people will get uh, the transfer. But if the if everybody, even the rich, so we, we, we grouping the rich here on the right of the graph, they also get the A. So their income also increases by O. So everybody gets a transfer if we just shift the straight line up. Okay, so this means non-targeted transfers of A, that's the amount, to everyone. It decreases the number of people in poverty from Y2 to Y1. So the universal transfer is effective to, to uh, move this group of people Y1 to Y2 out of poverty. So now only Y1 is below poverty. So we used to have all of those people below the poverty line. Now we only have a smaller number of people below the poverty line. So is this a good way of, of doing a transfer? Well, what we do see is that, let's, let's look at the, the poor people before the transfers. What does that orange part of that second line mean? It means many of the people that were poor, everyone between Y1 and Y2, all of those are now lying above the poverty line. 
They're above the poverty line. So that's not the idea. That shouldn't be the idea of transfers. If if we want to eradicate poverty, we just want to keep get them up to the poverty line and perhaps a little above, we, but we don't want to make them rich from state transfers. Is that true? Isn't that true? What about the green portion? That's even worse. The green portion means we have given transfers to rich people. And that's also not what we want to do. So um, just shifting the line to the left is not the best idea. Non-targeted transfers is not necessarily the best idea. So what should we be doing? Before we get there, let's just look at Y2 again. What does that blue triangle mean? Well, the blue triangle is the total income of everybody up to Y2. So the straight line shows the income per person, but if we add all of the persons up to Y2's income together, then we show it in an area underneath the curve. The area underneath the curve is also always the total uh, amount, uh, uh, the total value of whatever the variable is on the line. So the variable is income and the blue is the total income. What we would like to have those Y2 to receive is that. That's what we want them to receive. If all of the poor people receive at least up to the poverty line, if everybody could, could have 450 rands or whatever the line is, that's the ideal. So what is the difference? That blue triangle is the difference and we call that the poverty gap. That triangle is called the poverty gap. So that's very important. You need to know that poverty gap. So let's go back to the textbook. Now these graphs are starting to make a little bit more sense to us. It's not just lines and numbers and letters and so on. And we have to read the text very carefully to understand what's going on. So the on the left, the poverty gap to start with is, is that triangle. And then if we would give a non-targeted universal transfer of value C in this case, the poverty gap would certainly decrease. So on the right, they want to rec try and rectify some of the mistakes that we're making. So now we have a targeting idea. It's not a universal transfer, but we're targeting only the Y2. We only want to give to the first Y2 uh, individuals, namely the poor. I just wanted to say that we have a name for making a mistake of giving to, um, transfers to the rich. That's a type 2 error. We're including, if we include too many people, in, uh, in the redistribution scheme, or if we include the wrong people into the distribution scheme, then we make a type 2 error of inclusion. So on the right, after the transfer, so let's say we move to the new line. I'll, sh I'll explain this, this thing just now. But so let's say that we shift, we, we have a targeted transfer of value C, so we, can you see we give value C only to the poor. So it's only a, a portion of the line is shifting up. The rest of the line is still without any um, transfers. But then we still have a poverty gap, the red triangle. So if we miss some uh, persons and we don't eradicate poverty for them, we say we... we uh, we have type error of exclusion. Now we're not really excluding the Y1 uh, number of people, but we we don't solve their problem. So type 1 error means you're excluding some persons from a benefit, and type 2 error is you include the wrong persons into a benefit. What would the yellow triangle mean? So the yellow triangle, so can you see that this scheme as a targeted transfer, uh, they give everybody that is poor a specific transfer C, but people that are close to the border of being poor or rich, 
now benefit. So everybody in the yellow group gets too much from from the government. So if we could get give some of that yellow uh, area its value to the the red triangle, then we could solve the problem and have some money spared over. Okay, so figure 8.2 is obviously very important. I've spent almost a whole video on it uh, and so you have to read everything and understand everything in these graphs. Very important. This is a nice semester test question. Very nice. Okay, read through the costs of targeting. Obviously, this it mu they must be administrative costs. How do you determine whether someone is poor or rich? They have to prove it. You have to have a find a way for cheating. I mean, we read so much in the newspapers now that people earning salaries also get the 350 COVID grants. It's just it would be so difficult to catch. Uh, people who are not really eligible for these so that you can think the administrative cost is very high then there's a whole literature on incentive costs will you uh, stop looking for a job if you get a grant there's not very clear evidence of that but but if theoretically speaking one could think that if you get a grant from the government or if, for example if you get an old age grant then you might decide to retire earlier uh, and then, I don't know if there's a stigma cost, I get a grant, so what, what will people think of me? So there are costs of, of targeting as well, and you need to, to know exactly about that. Okay, moving back to the textbook, the final section here, fiscal incidents. The most important thing that you need to know about fiscal incidents is what does it mean. So the first definition is very, very important. So the fiscal incidence means what are the effects of the government programs. So we measure the effects of, of government expenditure and we also me measure the effect of government taxes and then we compare the two. So what they do in this section is they have different definitions of income, market income, net market income, disposable income, post-fiscal, final. You don't have to know the, the um, definitions of that. Don't worry about the definitions. Then they show how the Gini coefficients differ with the different incomes. So the fiscal incidence basically shows that if you move from post-fiscal income to final income, for example, then you can improve the Gini coefficient by so many points. Now just notice that this table is all screwed up. I don't know if that's a bad word or not, but Namibia and South Africa is interchanged. This should be South Africa, and that should be Namibia. Here should we should also have South Africa and Namibia, so the table is awkward. So uh, that's why I, I don't want you to spend too much time on this, other than read what fiscal incidence is, and uh, because fiscal incidence is very important, and we will get back to that later. And this then concludes the second video and it is also the only two videos on chapter 8.